Museum. Um, we're very pleased to have him here and he's going to uh, introduce, the, introduce the event to you all. Recording in progress. Hi, I'm Ian Peter McDonald, and I must thank you, Alan, for pulling this together and your, your energy and, uh, and enthusiasm for helping our wonderful curator, Vanessa, in, 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 driving, this, in driving this forward. Uh, I don't know if any of you or all of you have been to the West Island Museum, possibly the finest museum in, in Great Britain. It is uh, located on Cameron Square in Fort William. We were founded 100 years ago next year, and this initiative is all part of us telling the world somewhat more about the history of our museum and celebrating that centenary. Uh, we, will be, we will be doing a number of different events, and we have a, a, a major capital program that we will be launching next year uh, to give us somewhat more access and a, and a much more sustainable future. Anybody who has visited the museum will know that the um, curatorial and management team more or less stack above each other in, in, in the library space. And uh, we have so many more visitors than, than we used to do so that we need, to, we, need, we need to expand. Just to give you a brief on that, we had in the region of 8,000 8, visitors a year 10 years ago, and we now have over 60,000 in normal times. So it's been an immense growth that we have been party to. Now, this initiative is um, uh, ha has been largely to celebrate that centenary, and it is, uh, has allowed us to look at this remarkable artifact that we have had since very nearly the beginning of the collection. Chris will tell us, Dr. Chris will tell us somewhat more about it in the course of the, of the talk today. Um, twice in history, people have actually printed from it. Again, that will be, become clear, but that was almost a century ago when they did that. So this is a really exciting dynamic. And it was a pleasure to work with um, Alistair at the Edinburgh Printmakers to actually see a print come true from this remarkable and old artifact. Alistair, we're looking forward to your words on that. Uh, so what I want to briefly do is express our thanks for the enormous energy and enthusiasm that so many people have put into this and expertise. So we're looking forward to, to hear your observations and build in doing so a much greater canon on the subject, which I think will be valuable to, to later generations and generate some real expertise. I want to say finally that um, our museum was awarded a Queen's Award for Volunteer Services this year. That, and that, that reflects the impact that we have on our community. We may not be a big museum, but we punch way above our weight. Uh, people love coming to see us. Anybody look at our TripAdvisor observations will tell you. And what we are is a proper museum where people can come and see things. They can't yet touch them, but they can certainly see things and find out about them and see the remarkable elements of our history in this particular area. And our community supports us. The volunteers get enormous value out of joining us through, through the week. And without them, we could not keep this show on the road. Anyway, that's the background to who we are and what we're going to do. Really excited about today's event. And thank you so much for both attending and for those who have put the, the thought and energy into writing and giving us some thoughts. We really very much appreciate it. So thank you very much indeed for that. Alan, that's my piece. Thank and, you very much. Uh, for that. We commissioned a film uh, through, through the imagination of our friend Carrie, who's on our board. Um, a film has been produced which illustrates uh, what we're talking about here, and we'll introduce the subject. Yeah, and it will just take maybe it will just take a, a second or two for the for the film to um, load up, but it's um, coming our way. We have a very special printing plate um, in our collection that was commissioned by Bonnie Prince Charlie in 1746. 
I'm um, not it hearing was any abandoned shortly after the Battle of Culloden and oh, dropped in a bog where it remained for a few decades um, before it was rediscovered. It's known to have been printed from twice in the past um, and hasn't been printed from since 1928. As part of the West Highland Museum's centenary celebrations, we're going to be printing from it again. We're going to be using beech wood um, from trees that were planted at Atna Carry in 1745 and the frame is going to be crafted by a master craftsman. Well, it's actually called the Strange Plate after um, Robert Strange. Um, nothing strange about it at all. Um, Robert Strange was uh, basically a Jacobite. He followed Bonnie Prince Charlie from the onset. He was in love with a lady called Isabella Lumsden. Um, and basically she said, if you want to be with me, you need to follow the prince. So he did. April 1746, during this period that the army were stationed in and about Inverness, the 1st Battalion of the Lifeguards, commanded by Lord Elko, were billeted upon Culloden House. One evening, after I had retired to rest, an express arrived from Inverness between 11 and 12, acquainting me that the Prince was desirous of seeing me as soon as possible. Just before Culloden, um, for various reasons, the Jacobites were running out of money. There have been unsuccessful deliveries of treasure um, that have been either lost or stolen on the west coast. Mm -hmm. So in desperation, um, the prince decided that he'd need to issue his own banknotes. So he summoned um, Robert Strange, who was a well-known engraver of the time, to um, Inverness, where he was um, stationed. Um, and he basically came in the dead of night and instructed Robert Strange um, to engrave a banknote that could basically, well, a copper plate that could be used as print banknotes for the Jacobite cause. His Royal Highness was desirous of taking my opinion relating to the circulation of one species of money or another, which had been thought expedient to issue to the service of the army in general, but more particularly amongst the soldiery. The Prince was very pleased apparently with the design um, and the result was the copper printing plate that we now have in our collection. This is on Loch Lagan side in Inverness here, and this is where the plate was found around 1835. Perhaps it's dropped as he crossed the ford, who knows. But how did it come to, to be with the West Highland Museum? Well, we bought it, the museum bought it in 1928 at a public um, auction in London at Sotheby's when the effects of Clooney Macpherson were sold. And it was he who brought it to public notice with um, an article in the Society of Antiquities Journal where it was pictured um, and described. He would have had to have crossed the river here on his way to Badenoch where he spent uh, about 10 days at a place which became known as Clooney's Cage, which was a hideout up here. It would have been carried around in somebody's sack for four months. So it mm -hmm. could well have been, if you yeah. started off in fairly good form, it would have been a bit scraped and battered. Mm -hmm. Well, our expert printmaker, um, who will be printing from the plates for us now, he yes. says that it was very poorly constructed yes. as well. So mm -hmm. as well as being poorly constructed, it, it, it then obviously deteriorated, yes. having been yes. lost for, for a considerable period of time mm -hmm. before it was rediscovered again yeah. in yeah. what we think was the 1830s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 90 years somewhere along the river. So he needs to get so the trees would have been planted uh, in 1745 and uh, making them uh, 276 years old. Uh, quite incredible. They would have been planted by Lochiel of the time in 1745, as we understand, as, a, as an avenue. Um, but when the call came in that the that Bonnie Prince Charlie had landed, it suddenly changed the way he had to walk, operate. So they were just dug in as as they are, so if you, you can see them all grouped together in strange uh, numbers, and then the idea would have been that he would have come back to plant the avenue properly. You might not think, you know, a tree that size, that's, there's no way that's 250 years, 270 years old. Counted the rings, and yes, they are, they are actually that old. <laughs> we have a, a few trees that have come down more recently, um, and we have collected that wood for you. Um, it's just up at the castle just now, um, ready for you to use.
So the next phase of the project, we decided in um, 2022 is our centenary, so we thought it would be a good opportunity to consider um, printing from the plate again. Um, so we um, took the plate down to um, Alistair Clark at Edinburgh Printmakers. Um, Alistair was very helpful, he assessed the plate for us. Um, he wasn't very impressed with the quality of the plate, um, which from reading Strange's memoirs, we know that it was knocked up in a hurry um, and it's had a bit of a sort of hard life buried underground for 90 odd years. So this is the, this is the back of the plate and you can see the colour that the, the plate came in when I, when I first saw it. Well, but, you know, the printing process polishes it. It's a tricky plate to ink. But we were really pleased that he, he decided that we were able to print from the plate again, which was really exciting for us mm -hmm. um, to be able to do that and be able to offer another little print run and offer people the opportunity to purchase them for our centenary. Thank you very much. That was a, 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 a lovely film. There, it was. It was fascinating to see the um, workmanship that was going into uh, making the frames and, and the like, and also the whole story of the print, um, giving us some some great context for, for some of the discussion that's going to come come up next. And next, we are pleased to have. Um, Vanessa, Vanessa Martin, uh, curator at the museum, who's going to give us an outline of the uh, project um, and the 1746 construction of the strange plate. So I'll just hand over to you, Vanessa. Um, thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, so um, as Alan says, I'm Vanessa Martin and I'm curator at the West Highland Museum in Fort William. And I've been responsible for coordinating this project um, along with Chris Robinson and various other people at the museum. Um, we've been working on it, like I say, for 14 months. Um, and the film has given a really good overview of what we're trying to achieve. And I'd like to thank our filmmaker, Jen Martin, um, for all the hard work she did in producing such an excellent um, film for us. Um, so we've involved project, um, sorry, experts um, from museums, um, art galleries, universities, and craftsmen and auctioneers throughout the process. Um, but we're particularly grateful um, to Professor Hugh Cheap from the University of Highlands and Islands and Anne Gunn from um, the University of St Andrews for all the help that they've provided with research. And also um, Colin um, Fraser, who'll be talking a bit later, um, for the assistance he's provided throughout the process, um, offering us advice. And again, um, the people that actually helped with the construction of the print and the, the frame for the um, thing that's going to be auctioned. Um, that's um, Peter Davis, who crafted the wood from the beech wood for us, uh, Gillian Sloan as well. And of course, Alistair Clark, who will be talking a bit later as well. He um, produced the fine prints for us. Um, so now I'm just going to go on to explain a bit about the plate um, and why and how it was constructed. Um, the Basically, the Jacobites funding, um, it had always been an issue, um, money for the campaign. Um, the Jacobites were often short of cash throughout the campaign and were often sort of sourcing, trying to source money from France and um, Spain. So the situation by the 21st of March 1746 uh, was very fragile. Uh, Prince Charles Edward Stuart had been in Inverness for a wee while and he'd effectively run out of cash by this point. Um, Lord John Drummond had reported to France that they needed money for absolutely everything at this point and feared that the army would actually disperse um, if nothing was provided. Um, three days later, ironically, um, the French landed um, 13,000 louis d'or of gold on the Scottish west coast. Uh, but this was promptly captured by the, the British government forces. And despite the Jacobites' best ever efforts to retrieve it, um, they were unable to do so. Um, so it was perhaps in desperation that in 1746, um, the Prince decided um, by April that he needed to um, issue some emergency money and decided upon the idea of banknotes. Robert Strange um, was commissioned to design and etch the notes, hence the reason that the plate is known as the Strange Plate. Um, and his memoirs provide a really detailed account of how the plate was created. 
And so they, they show um, that he was summoned to the prince's bedchamber in the middle of the night. He was billeted with the lifeguards at this point um, in the Culloden house under Lord Elko. Um, but he was summoned to Inverness and he attended immediately. He was shown to the prince's bedchamber and given this very special commission. 24 hours later, he returns um, to the prince, reports that there's no rolling printing press anywhere in Inverness, but that he's been able to um, engage a carpenter and a mechanic and found that they would be able to construct a printing press for him. Uh, well, basically, he then presents the prince with a design, um, which is the rose and the thistle, which are noted in the gallery. Um, we've recently, it's come to our attention via uh, Colin at Lyman Turnbull, that there's a cartouche that belonged to um, Prince Charles Edward Stuart, um, dating back to 1745. And the cartouche, cartouche um, bears remarkable similarities in design to the rose and thistle design on the um, banknotes. So we believe that this is the origin of it. The cartouche is now in the care of Falkirk Muir Trust. Um, so, right. So again, the memoirs, they go on to um, outline the um, difficulties that Strange had with the manufacture of the printing plate. Um, he had a Although he managed to, managed to engage a carpenter, um, the coppersmith refused to work on a Sunday and took much persuasion before um, that he was persuaded that he was able to break the Sabbath and work. Um, the, cop the quality of the copper was poor quality, which we've already discussed, but that was all that could be found at the time. So the decision has to be taken that it would be etched on rather than engraved. Um, so by the 13th of April, um, Strange is working away into the night, etching his design onto the copper plate. And by the 14th of April, he delivers the plate to Bonnie Prince Charlie's um, secretary in Inverness. He then returns to um, Culloden House, where his comrades joke that they'll soon be being paid with the money that he's created. And Strange retorts, well, no, nope, that's not going to be the case because we're going to beat the British government forces and we'll be using the Duke of Cumberland's cash to pay our forces. Um, I mean, sadly for the Jacobites, that isn't the plan, but that wasn't some come to fruition. Um, so the plate was never actually used because the Battle of Culloden took place just a few days later on the 16th of April. Um, and at that point, as everyone knows, the Jacobites were defeated and the Jacobite army dispersed. Um, Robert Strange himself did fight at Culloden and he survived. Um, he became a fugitive and um, went into hiding, um, as did a number of Jacobites. Um, Ian Fitzgerald will talk a bit more about his escapades um, during this period a bit later on in today's events. Um, so the plate was basically abandoned on the flight from Culloden and was left in a bog on the west end of Loch Lagan um, at the location that was shown in the film earlier. Um, so by 1750, Robert Strange has settled in London. Um, all has been forgiven. Um, the Jack by the Jack and the Jacobites are sort of welcomed back into the fold to a certain extent. Um, he establishes himself as a leading engraver um, and has reconciled to the Hanoverian uh, regime to the extent that by 1787, um, George III has um, given him a knighthood. Um, sadly, he never saw his printing plate again, but there is documentary records that show that years later, he says that he gladly would have paid a considerable sum um, to obtain a specimen of, the, of a print from the plate, um, which is really nice to hear. <laughs> um, so that's a bit about Sir Robert Strange and the printing plate, but he was also um, a very talented individual in his own right. Um, so I'm briefly going to outline some items that are in the 100 objects digital gallery, um, which have also been attributed to Robert Strange. So first of all, we've got the Holyrood House Ball Fan, um, which is going to be talked about a bit later on, and there'll be some pictures um, that, that um, Ian Fitzgerald will share. Um, and this was gifted to ladies who attended the ball in Edinburgh in the autumn of 1745. And that was a ball that was thrown by the Prince to celebrate the Jacobite victory at the Battle of Preston Pans. Then we have some portraits um, that Robert Strange had on, um, that have done, been done by Robert Strange. Um, the first one was on loan to us by um, Angus MacDonald, and it's an oil on canvas that's displayed in our Jacobite Gallery and is also in the 100 Objects Gallery if you want to explore this at some point. 
Um, and we've also got various miniatures of the prints um, on display in the 100 Objects Digital Gallery and again in the physical gallery at the museum. So all of these portraits um, were from works by Robert Strange um, or created after him um, from the portrait that was created by um, Robert, uh, sorry, Alan Ramsey um, in Edinburgh in 1745. These images are frequently reproduced and used effectively as propaganda um, to promote the Jacobite cause throughout the um, throughout the campaign. So, and they're also thought to be some of the earliest works by Robert Strange. So you can explore the Jacobite section of the gallery as um, sort of Ian's demonstrating here now, um, and basically find out more about the objects in our collection that are associated with Strange. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Vanessa. That was uh, fascinating um, uh, account of the construction of the plate, and and also it was, it was nice to see um, an introduction to these uh, objects. And I, I think you can go there now. WHM, well, not now because we've got a fascinating topic on, but WHM one hundred dot org um, is is where that uh, those, those galleries are. But right now, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce um, Ian Fitzgerald. Um, and if we're going to hear more about Strange and Isabella, we're going to hear about their, their biographical background. And, um, and I'm, I'm really you know, excited to be able to hear about that. And uh, Ian Fitzgerald is, is the man to tell us all about the background to Strange and Isabella. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, say a few words about Robert Strange. Um, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge um, Margaret Strange, who's joining the event. Margaret um, is the widow of the former chief of clan Strange Belkaski, Major Timothy Strange. So it's wonderful to see you again, Margaret. Um, look, I'd, next slide, if you can, uh, Ian. Um, I'd just like to note that yesterday, the 14th of July, marked the 300 years since Robert Strange was born. So Robert Strange was known as Robbie by his family and friends. So um, happy birthday for Robert yesterday. Um, there's a story about Robert that, uh, or Robbie I'd like to share, which relates to another money-making scheme that uh, Robbie got involved with for the Prince, but I'll come back to that later. I'd like just to maybe do a bit of a recap on some of the extensive work that Robert Strange has produced. And so look, uh, next slide, please. So we've just talked about the episode Missus, which is the iconic uh, image of Prince Charles that Robbie engraved in 1745. And that was taken off the recently rediscovered portrait done by Alan Ramsey, which now sits in the National Portrait Museum in Edinburgh. Um, so that when um, Dr. Lucinda Lax has, has concluded that was done in 1745. Next slide, please. Um, as Vanessa has mentioned, uh, Robbie produced a number of Jacobite fans that were purportedly used for the uh, ball at Holyrood. Um, one of these fans, as Vanessa pointed out, is, is in the West Highland Museum. Um, and I think it's an, it's an exquisite uh, item and it's well worth a visit. It, these cover a whole lot of Jacobite uh, images, um, that is really important again that's just a wonderful piece of work and i'm sorry that photo doesn't adjust it's well worth just going to see that item alone next slide please ian the other piece of uh, jacobite uh, uh, work that robbie produced was the the amen glasses these were glasses engraved with various uh, verses from the jacobite anthem finishing with amen and uh, it was recently concluded that, that Robbie is believed to be the sole uh, engraver for the 37 authenticated Amen glasses. Next slide, please. Um, Robbie also was a prolific uh, producer of Renaissance art. That's what he's most famous for. He produced over 75 engravings of Renaissance art. They often took more than six months or more to produce. And Robbie was... Uh, a key figure in the establishment of the commercial art market in the late 1700s, but that's probably a story for another day. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, the apotheosis of the Princess Octavius and Alfred, which uh, Robbie did in 1786, aged 65, 40 years after Culloden. Uh, this engraving um, shows the ascension um, to heaven of George III's two sons, Octavius and Alfred. And George III was so moved by this engraving that he, he knighted Robbie on the spot. Um, and following Robbie's knighthood, uh, he sought and gained the right to the title of Strange of Belkaski. Next slide, please. Um, look, much has been written about Robbie, but I don't think any story worth telling with Robbie uh, can be told without some reference to Isabella Lumison, uh, Robbie's sweetheart, partner, and wife of 45 years. So I'd like to tell you one story that relates to Robbie and Isabella just after Culloden. Next slide, please. The, the engraving of the banknotes wasn't Robbie's first uh, involvement in a money-making scheme for the prince. In January 1746, a group of reinforcements from Orkney arrived to join the prince, including Robbie's close friend, William Belfer. Um, and these group of reinforcements came up with this wonderful idea that a quick way to raise some money for the prince was to send a small raiding party north to Orkney to plunder the estates of those families still loyal to the government. Now, this uh, scheme was to have devastating consequences for Robbie, his family and friends in Orkney. Next slide, please. One of the families that were plundered was the Moody family. Um, and the head of the Moody family at that time was 23-year-old Benjamin Moody, who was well known to William Balfour and Robbie. They were contemporaries, the same, same age. Um, at that time, uh, Captain Benjamin Moody was a captain in the British 74th Regiment of Foot pursuing the Jacobites. Um, because Benjamin was on active duty, uh, the defence of his estate was left to his widowed mother, and a few servants. So it's not surprising that after Culloden that Benjamin volunteered to go north to Orkney to pursue the Jacobite leaders in Orkney. And Benjamin extracted a heavy price on the Jacobites uh, for the scheme. Um, in July, uh, Benjamin was inter interrogating some prisoners and he, and he learned of Robbie's involvement with the prince and Benjamin Moody quickly realised that if he could capture Robbie, he could force him to provide the evidence that would convict William Belfer and the other Jacobite leaders. And so he wrote to Edinburgh seeking the arrest of Robbie. Next slide, please. Later in July 1746, Robbie, just after his 25th birthday, which is uh, so 275 years ago this week, he crept back into Edinburgh to hide with Isabella. Now, it wasn't long before word of Robbie's uh, return to Amber reached officials, and it didn't take officials long to think the first place you'd go and look would be Isabella's, because she was an ardent Jacobite supporter and known to be Robbie's sweetheart. So again, it wasn't long before officials were pounding on Isabella's door, demanding to be let in. Isabella saw the fear and panic in Robbie's eyes, and as Isabella always did, took control of the situation very calmly, ordered one of the servants to go slowly to the door to let the officials in while she hatched a plan. Now, Isabella was also renowned for her sewing. So she walked over to her sewing table by the window, sat down and turned to Robbie. And fortunately, Robbie was, was not a tall man. And he, she commanded him to basically kneel down quickly and crawl under her skirts with those bloomer skirts fashion of the day. Um, so the officials looked high and down, up and down, and couldn't find Robbie. And while they were doing this, Isabella sat very calmly sewing and singing, while a very quiet and no doubt very nervous Robbie lay hidden under her skirts. It, it's quite clear that if Robbie had been arrested at that time, his involvement in the banknotes would most likely have been discovered, and therefore there was a real risk of execution. Robbie remained in hiding until June 1747, until the Act of Grace was passed. Next slide. Yes. The story of Robbie and uh, hiding under Isabella's skirt is, is, is a favourite family anecdote, but for me, it's a wonderful analogy of their life together for 45 years, of 
Robbie, this incredibly gifted and talented artist, and Isabella, the organizer and protector. So I'd just like to invite you, as you look at the banknotes or any other Robert Strange's works, to, to look behind the item to the people behind that item, Isabella and Robert. Isabella and Robert lived in an age of incredible social, economic, political, religious and technological change. And theirs were two lives well lived, which were intertwined with love, adventure, courage and sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. This is, and I, you're, we're not quite synced up in time frames, are we? we you're, you're quite a long way for us at the moment. Yes, it is. Uh, it's about uh, one thirty in the morning for me. You're looking very. You're looking very bright and uh, energetic for one thirty in the morning. Huh? Well done, and well done, and thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm sure it was fascinating kind of really bring brings to life the whole I, idea of the plate and the, the it, and the personal stories um behind it thank you very much um um I th I, next we're going to hear about contemporary scottish banknotes and i suppose a kind of fascinating topic of um the the, the use of paper money in the 18th century and i, I guess that's quite early in the in the use of of paper money that we're now um well we're, i suppose we're stopping using paper money now aren't we? i was going to say that we use all the time but i can't remember the last time i used um a piece of paper money but but in any case um and we're really honored to have jonathan calloway here who is the expert on this topic and he, um, he's going to talk to us um, about that from now Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me and my slides will appear right now. Um, as it says here, I'm a director of the International Banknote Society. And so I have been collecting and studying and researching paper money in all its shapes and forms for um, a very large number of years. Um, and, and I was also uh, the co-author of a book called Paper Money of Scotland, which is um, two volumes and... Um, 1140 pages of detail on all the paper money that has ever appeared in Scotland from 1695 through to the present day. Uh, when, of course, now, of course, all our paper is becoming polymer, but um, paper money is the term that we will use. Uh, um, now, what I wanted to start off with, and you can move to the next slide, please, <coughs> um, is and just have a look at the, the Scottish banknotes that were around in 1746. And then we'll look more widely at the use of paper money um, in the 18th century. Um, um, a lot to cover in 10 minutes, but uh, we'll see how far we get. Uh, next slide, please. So this is where it all started with the Bank of Scotland. The Bank of Scotland was founded in 1695 and started issuing paper money, its own notes, um, the year after. Now, this particular uh, note is uh, dated 1731, and as you can see, is a very simple design. Now, um, these notes, and in fact, those of the, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland that we'll come to in a second, um, were engraved on copper plate, but they were um, fully engraved. And um, as far as we know, the earliest uh, recorded engraver uh, of, of uh, Bank of Scotland notes was uh, was James Clark, who was actually um, the uh, an engraver at the Scottish Mint. So he was actually used to working on uh, metal coinage rather than paper money. Um, but his, uh, this particular note and um, subsequent ones were engraved not by him, but by um, Joseph Cave, who was the nephew of his wife. So these things were to an extent kept in the family. And this, the, uh, J Joseph Cave was also an engraver at the Scottish Mint. Um, and the paper that they used um, would be specially made, and it had a watermark. And this particular note was um, came from paper made at Yester Mill, which is just outside Edinburgh. Um, now, you can see it's a very simple design. The Bank of Scotland kept their designs very simple. And to combat forgery, which was a 
big problem from the very beginning. All they did was use different fonts, as you can see at different parts of the text on that note, um, you've got different uh, styles of, um, of script. Um, now, next slide, please. Uh, now, <clears throat> from 1730 uh, um, onwards, um, the notes were actually so-called option notes. Um, the, the, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland had become a very fierce rival of the, uh, the Bank of Scotland. So what they did was they introduced a longer payment promise. And as you can see, there's a lot more text here, which basically says, we promise to pay the bearer on demand or at the option of the directors in six months' time um, with interest payable for that period. Um, now, this note would definitely have been circulating at the time of... Uh, Culloden at the time that uh, Strange was um, being uh, recruited to prepare the, the plate for, for Bonnie Prince Charlie. Now, uh, the story says that they tried to get hold of um, a couple of Scottish notes uh, to use them as a sort of basis for the design, but they couldn't get hold of any. Um, had they done so, this or the, its predecessor without the option clause would probably have been what they found. And as before, very simple design, uh, there is some ornamentation down the left-hand side of the note. That is the so-called check mark, um, because these books were bound. They had counterfoils, and they were bound in books. And when it was issued, they would have cut it down the side through that um, um, ornamentation. Uh, and when the note was presented, they would have matched it up to make sure it was um, a genuine one and not, uh, not a forgery. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Now, the Royal Bank appeared on the scene in 1727, uh, and it does feature in the story of Bonnie Prince Charlie, uh, uh, as, as, you, as I'm sure you're aware, when, when he first formed his army and headed south, um, he um, entered Edinburgh, and at that time the Royal Bank um, took steps to avoid having to pay gold against um, as their notes, and they, they gathered up as many of their notes as they could, took them up to Edinburgh Castle and burnt them. And this is a note of the um, Royal Bank that was circulating in 1727. Um, it has a portrait on it, that is uh, George II, uh, that particular portrait. Uh, and of course, the Royal Bank was closely allied to the Hanoverian cause. Um, and they put the portrait on, which is a very good anti-forgery device because um, uh, there was a, there were there were eventually forgeries attempted of, of Royal Bank notes, but um, the forgers found it difficult to replicate exactly uh, that portrait, and that was uh, proved a very good uh, defensive um, uh, device. But this is a very rare note. This was issued the day that the bank opened. Um, and um, sold for several thousand pounds a few years ago. So um, just to give you an idea of the value of these things. The next slide, please. Um, this is a slightly later Royal Bank note, and probably um, you can see that the, the portrait has been re-engraved. Um, and this would probably have been the plate that was circulating at the time of Culloden. Um, and um, another thing to note here, it's, it's payable, it's the amount is 20 shillings sterling, but they also express it in the old Scottish pounds value of 12 pounds Scots. So the, the exchange rate, which was set in uh, 1707, was 12 pounds Scots for one pound sterling. And that's um, stated on the note. Now, I think it's quite interesting that um, this note was engraved by an English engraver called Rob Richard Cooper, um, who moved up to Edinburgh once he got this particular piece of work, and in fact, spent the rest of his career in Edinburgh. Now, Cooper was, uh, had an apprentice called Andrew Bell, who was also became an engraver, and he was one of the first promoters of the Encyclopedia Britannica, so there's an interesting connection there. But another connection is one of Richard Cooper's other apprentices was, in fact, Robert Strange, although he didn't engrave any Royal Bank notes, but there is a direct connection between this and these very early Royal Bank notes and um, Robert Strange. And as... With the other notes I've shown you, they were all engraved on copper plate um, and um, are um, today extremely rare. Now, moving on, um, next slide, please. Thank you. Now, um, in 1746, around the time of Culloden, in fact, um, a third bank appeared on the scene. 
Um, it's called the British Linen Company. It was actually um, known as a um, manufacturer and trader of linen rather than as a bank. But they quickly found that um, moving into the banking business made them more money than actually uh, the linen business itself. And this is the earliest surviving note of theirs. It's dated slightly later than Culloden, 1754. Exceptionally rare note. And again, it's got a vignette, but otherwise it's a pretty simple design. Um, and incidentally, that was also engraved by uh, Richard Cooper, who seemed to have got a bit of a stranglehold on the market at this point. Now, if we move to the next slide, just put this in for a, a matter of interest. This is um, 1747, a year after Culloden. The first bank outside Edinburgh was, uh, was founded, and it was in Aberdeen. And there's an ex this is an extremely rare note that actually sold for even more than the, uh, the first Royal Bank of Scotland note, um, incidentally, uh, again in auction several years ago. And this particular note is uh, for £5 sterling or £60 Scots. Um, but this did predate, uh, post-date rather, uh, Culloden itself. So I just wanted to give you a very quick overview of what's um, available in Scotland. Um, or what was circulating in Scotland at that time. Um, I'm just going to move on now to the next slide, um, which shows you that emergency money, and I did, you know, we, on, on the subject of emergency money, um, at that time, and, and in fact, for most of the 18th century, if emergencies arose, um, they used coin or metal rather than, um, this is a silver plate, in fact, the, this particular piece. And I'm just showing it as an example of how emergency money was normally uh, created. They used metal. Next slide, please. Um, now, the, the, the interesting thing about that is that um, paper money um, is, uh, was beginning to spread in terms of use in the 18th century um, around Europe. But the very first use that I can find of paper money for emergency purposes, um, which is exactly what would have been the case with, uh, with Bonnie Prince Charlie, the very first use of, uh, of, of paper uh, to create currency was, in fact, the effort that we are discussing today, this Robert Strange plate. Um, so in numismatic terms, it was of great historic significance. It's, it's, it would have been the very first had they um, been able to print the notes off. Um, this is just an example of the very first European uh, banknote, which was uh, 1666. It didn't last very long. Um, the bank was a, a private bank. It wasn't, uh, you know, a government bank. Um, they went bust very quickly, but it shows you that paper money does predate uh, the period that we're talking about. Uh, now, next slide, please. Um, I'm sorry I'm having to rush through these a little bit. Um, we shouldn't forget that our... Um, uh, uh, cousins, shall we call them that, in uh, North America were also very early users of paper money. And in a way, this was emergency money too, because they didn't have the metal. They hadn't, at the time, the, uh, the colonies that um, England and later uh, Great Britain had uh, founded in uh, along the um, east coast of America. Uh, they didn't, and they hadn't found sufficient quantities of copper or any other metal. So their currency was paper. They haven't done any, any other uh, source of material available for, for um, issuing their, uh, issuing necessary money. And this was a fundraiser, incidentally, uh, to raise money for a war with, the, uh, with French Canada. Um, and, it, and it is the very earliest. It predates not only the Bank of Scotland, but also the Bank of England. So this is the earliest paper money um, in the English-speaking English world, 1690. Next slide, please. Um, and then we have, uh, there's a similar piece very slightly later in uh, Connecticut, which again was uh, um, issued for the same purpose, to raise money to fight a war. Next slide, please. And this is the final slide I'm going to show. Um, it's a later issue, um, but in uh, after the uh, French Revolution in 1789, um, there was a, a, a huge shortage of uh, currency, and so they resorted to paper. And so these French early, early French um, assignats, as they were called, uh, were issued. And it's just another example of paper money. In fact, it 
became a disastrous uh, um, issue in that they issued far more than they could ever redeem. Uh, huge amounts of inflation and, and um, uh, an economic collapse. Um, now, I'd love to talk more about these things, but I, I don't think I, I think I've already over, overrun my time. Uh, but I just wanted to give a flavour of, of not only the Scottish paper money that was around at the time of Culloden, but also the wider picture. So thank you very much indeed for listening. Um, and um, I think we, we go back to um, Ian at this point. Thank you, thank you very much. For that. that was great. Um, Vanessa, is, is it Ian or is it Chris now? I, I, I thought we were... It's it's Chris, myself. Okay, Chris. Thank you very much. We're okay. going to hear about. Sorry, I'll just leave you to it. Just okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Ian. Um, Jonathan, that was fascinating um, and a, a real eye opener into uh, into paper money. Uh, there's another connection here in that the West Town Museum building. Uh, which we took over in the 1920s, was previously the British Linen Bank in Fort William. Um, so we have uh, a pedigree, not just in our, um, in our strange plate. Now, um, the strange plate has adorned the walls of the museum for almost 90-odd um, years. Uh, and what did we know about it until we really took special notice of it recently? Well, our, what we told our visitors was that it was found a few weeks after Culloden abandoned in a bog somewhere near Lagan. But um, that fact's not true. We've found a lot more since then. The museum acquired it in 1928 at a sale at Sotheby's in London, a sale of Clooney McPherson's effect, effects. Where was it found? The west end of Loch Lagan. Now, Loch Lagan is now a, pair of, a set of twin locks uh, some 30 miles distant from here. Um, in 1746, it was a single lock. Loch Lagan, and at the west end of it was a ford across the River Spear, which flowed out of, flowed out of Loch Lagan, um, a ford which was known as the Thieves' Ford. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite as clear as it would have been at those times, because in the 1930s, the British Aluminium Company um, built a dam downstream in the River Spear, creating a second Loch Lagan. And between the two Loch Lagans is what's known as the Cut, which is almost like a canal, which you saw on the film we showed you a few moments ago. But there's a bridge over that cut exactly in the spot where the, where the ford once was. And what's especially interesting in is that Prince Charles Edward crossed that ford um, on the 28th or the 29th of August, 1746, uh, when he was moving between Acna Carry and Clooney's Cage, um, somewhat further south in the Ben Alder range, and he recrossed it some two weeks later. Um, perhaps there's a connection there. Uh, it first comes to light the, in, in a printed form, the, the recognition of the plate in 1865, when an article was written in the Society, Proceedings of the Society of Antiquities of Scotland, um, reporting that the plate was in the possession of Clooney McPherson. Um, he had just obtained it probably that year in 1865, and it previously belonged to a General Hugh Ross, um, who had died the year before in 1864, and it had been given, it would seem, to Clooney at, at the time of uh, General Ross's death. Now, I've looked at General Ross's um, will, and there is actually no recognition of it. But who was General Hugh Ross of Kinloch Moidet? Well, it turns out he was a son of the manse of Kilmanevig. Now, Kilmanevig is a parish in Loch Harbour. Uh, I'm sitting in the, one of the, in the, the parish of Kilmanevig. Um, the Ross family were of the manse, the um, father of four sons, of whom Hugh Ross was the eldest, was a Thomas Ross, spoken of as the formidable Thomas Ross. He stayed at Tyrandrish, uh, half a mile in that direction, and a half a mile in that direction, up the hill, all the Rosses are buried. So, General Hugh Ross had it. He was the most senior and successful of the four sons of the family, all of whom were soldiers. How did he get it? Well, uh, his younger sister, Jean, married a John McNabb, 
who was variously described as a tenant farmer at Lagan. He wasn't quite so lowly, though. He's mentioned in some detail in the books by Thomas Sinton on the poetry of Badenoch. Uh, and uh, quite an interesting character. But it's just possible that this, 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 when it was found at the west end of Loch Lagan, 30 years before, says the report of 18, 1865, so it would have been 1835, that it was found it would have come into the possession of the Ross family um, through, the, uh, through Ross's sister and John McNabb, who was the factor in that area. Um, so conjecture, and this is really all it is, that the plate was found at the west end of Loch Lagan, probably beside the ford, um, or about the ford, possibly dropped by uh, or left by uh, Prince Charles Edward as he crossed it. Well, this is four and a half months after the Battle of Culloden, and was found accidentally, having spent 90 years uh, underground, found accidentally by who knows, um, but it would be passed up to the, uh, the factor of the time, uh, John McNabb, and then passed on to the most successful uh, member of the family, who was General Hugh Ross. Um, we're still doing some work on this. It's just possible something might turn up in the Clooney papers. Uh, the Arbeliki papers are being examined just now by one of our uh, supporters, Richard Sedgwick. If something comes up, we'll let you know. So the museum obtained in 1928, and Vanessa will be speaking about what we did with it then. But there are other prints which were taken from it. There is certainly one illustrated in the Society of Antiquities uh, article in 1865. And there is one in the British Museum, which was present, presented to them in 1911. But in the museum, we have another print which clearly precedes ours, which in fact was on display in our ex Jacobite exhibition in the museum in uh, 1925. And that's signed by W.B. Blakey. Walter B. Blakey, and it's clear that he must have made some 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 prints. Uh, an interesting man, um, very much involved with the printing industry and a Jacobite uh, enthusiast um, and expert. But um, at the time of the discovery of the uh, plate, where it came to public notice in 1865, Blakey was only 18 years old, so certainly he wouldn't have been involved with the very first prints. Uh, there are a one or two prints, apart from the one we have in the museum, one or two uh, are to be found locally, and other prints have come up for sale, but Vanessa, I'm sure, will speak more of those later. So we're still working on it. There's still a lot to do here, and hopefully even more information will turn up in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. That's a uh, fascinating the, the rediscovery and the, and the previous printing that has taken taken place. I, I think it's a, a really great initiative to um, be printing off from this uh, from from this plate. And I want to I want to get one for, for myself. So maybe Vanessa, you're going to be able to tell us how much they cost. Well, I, I think Chris uh, is uh, going to be covering that later. <laughs> that okay. <laughs> um, but but you've got stuff to say about the acquisition of the strange plate and. Uh, the Cameron prints, as amongst other things, I think. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, so I'm going to focus now on how the print came to the plate came to the museum, and also its association with Sir D. Y. Cameron, um, and also um, explain a bit about his 1928 prints from the plate. Um, so uh, I think Chris mentioned earlier we purchased um, the, the the printing plate from the Clooney sale. At Sotheby's in, in London in 1928, and we paid um, the grand sum of £430. Um, we managed to obtain this through fundraising and grants, um, and we we're really pleased, obviously, at the time that it was an important relic of the 1745 rising um, that the museum was able to obtain. Um, at that point, we were just six years old, um, but we'd already procured um, a significant Jacobite collection um, following the success of our 1925 Jacobite exhibition. Um, so some of these objects um, can be viewed in the 100 Objects Gallery. Um, th these include things like our iconic secret portrait, which is an anamorphic portrait of Bonnie Prince Charlie that you can only view through a reflective cylinder. 
Um, and also we've got a copy of our 1925 catalogue on display in, in the 100 Objects Digital Gallery too. Um, so, like we mentioned, we received a grant from what's now the Grant Fund, and um, we also had to do a lot of fundraising back in the 1920s as well to, to obtain the plate. Sir so D.Y. Cameron was instrumental in drumming up support um, to purchase the plate. We found a newspaper article in our archive um, which describes how Cameron went down to Glasgow um, with Lockheed's wife, I believe, um, and they were basically trying to encourage members of Clan Cameron to contribute towards the fundraising efforts. Um, so, so D.Y. Cameron himself, he was Sir David Young at Cameron and born in 1865. Um, he, in the 1920s and 30s, he was one of the most renowned um, Scottish painters and etchers in Britain. Um, he was knighted, knighted in 1924 and appointed the King's Painter in Scotland in 1933. He was one of the earliest museum members, and as we've already explained, he was very supportive of, of the new museum. And um, so when the museum acquired the Strange Plate in 1928 and the decision was made to print from it, uh, D.Y. Cameron was the perfect choice of artists to sort of carry out this task for us. Um, so we've got some of the D.Y. Cameron prints on, on the screen at the moment. Um, he produced 57 signed proofs from the Strange Plate um, some of these were retained at the museum, but 50 of them were sold for 10 and 6, and this was to raise money for our new fledgling museum. Um, so over the years, the banknotes have been cherished both, both by banknote collectors and Jacobite enthusiasts. Um, we do know of some others in other archives around, and um, we know um, the Bank of England contacted me a couple of years ago, so we know we have one in, they've got one in their collection and possibly National Library Scotland, but we'd be really keen to hear where any others have ended up. Um, Line and Turnbull sold two recently, one in 2019, one in 2020 at auction as well. Um, and issues of the Blakey print, which Chris spoke about a few minutes ago. Um, we know that the British Museum have, have a copy, as Chris mentioned, but also um, we found out just literally last week that the Drambui collection owned by William Grant and Sons, that they also have a, a copy of the Blakey print in their collection. But yeah, it'd be great to find out where, where others have, have ended up. Um, yeah, so, um, so that's Cameron's print, um, but because of his association with the museum, um, we've been really keen to acquire um, one of his paintings for our fine art collection. Um, in 2020, um, one of um, one was spotted, um, Pete, Ian Peter MacDonald, who introduced the event, um, our chair of directors, he spotted October in Noydart, um, which is at the was in the Fine Art Society in Edinburgh's window. Oh, there we go. That's it. Just come on screen. Um, this is an oil on canvas that was produced by um, Cameron um, and it's featured here in the gallery um, and also it's displayed in our Jacobite gallery um, alongside the strange plate. Um, it, it depicts perfectly the landscape um, of Loch Arbor in which um, the prince hid um, after his flight from Culloden um, when he was hiding from the Hanoverian troops um, before he, he managed to escape to France in September 1746. And again, this was purchased um, with the assistance of the Art Fund, the National Fund for Acquisitions, and um, a contribution from the family of the late John Gooch, who um, was a director of the museum um, and the, also a fan of Cameron, and the painting hangs in our gallery in his honour. Um, so you can, like I say, you can view, view it and find out more about the objects in, in sort of the narrative in, in the digital gallery, um, which is, I think, the address is www.whm100.org um, to explore the gallery. Um, so now I'm going to just talk a little bit about the 2021 prints. Um, so the, we took the decision for our 100th birthday, as we've already mentioned, um, to do something pretty special. And um, we thought that to enter yeah, to do this um, and also at the same time raise funds for the museum as we enter our new phase of our development. As Peeps mentioned earlier, um, visitor numbers have rocketed from like 9,000 to over 60,000 in the last 10 years. So we're sort of wanting to expand space and tell more narratives about the museum. Um, so this is like a truly unique project um, and it's been really exciting to be part of it. Um, we've had really good 
publicity and feedback already from all over the globe, um, from New Zealand to Scandinavia. Um, you know, it's it's really exciting. Um, so but initially when, when we came up with the project, um, the first thing we needed to decide was, was it ethical for us to print from the plate? Um, so I, I initially researched the ethics of printing. I consulted um, with the University of St Andrews, um, National Museum Scotland, um, and also looked at the Museum Association's Code of Ethics. Um, we came to the conclusion that it was okay to print from the plate because we were using it for the purposes for which the object had been produced in the first place. It was a printing plate and we were printing from it. So there didn't seem to be any, any issue from that respect. Um, just the main concern would be if there was any risk of damage to the plate. So the next stage, um, we, we had a look um, and basically risk assessed the plate. I consulted conservators um, and expert printmakers um, to consider whether or not it was safe to print from the plate. Um, and once we concluded it, it probably was, um, we then sought out an expert printmaker to carry out the task for us. Um, Edinburgh printmakers came highly recommended and so we contacted them and we've been working in partnership with them, them since. Um, the pandemic has very much impeded progress on the project, but I eventually managed to get down to Edinburgh with the plate in December 2020, um, along with another one of our directors, Carrie Gooch, um, and met with Alistair Clark, who's studio director at Edinburgh Printmakers. Um, he assessed the plate um, and undertook test prints and concluded from that that we were safely able to, to print, but recommended that we reduced our planned print run um, originally, we'd wanted to print um, 100 prints from the plate um, to celebrate our 100th birthday, um, but then we reduced this number to 45 to signify the 1745 rising. Um, but then after consultation with our collections and learning committee, it was decided to further reduce the run to 22 um, to um, signify 1922 to 2022, our anniversary. Um, and we'd also wanted to ensure that the plate can be printed from again in the future um, and that future generations at the museum can, can use the plate again um, in case there was any wear or tear from the plate. So Carrie and I were both really excited to see the first prints come off the press in December 2020, especially as they were the first prints that have been there since um, 1928. Um, we Again, we were planning on printing earlier in the year, but due to COVID-19 pandemic, um, the, we were unable to proceed as quickly as we'd have liked with the project. But by April 2021, um, Alistair was in a position to print from the plate. Um, and we're absolutely delighted with the results. Um, Alistair's done a really excellent job and he's provided top quality prints using the best available resources and materials. Um, yeah, so I think now it's, time really for Alistair to take over and explain a bit more about the prints for us. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot, Vanessa. Again, it's all coming together, you know, all the different aspects of the story are, are fascinating. Um, and um, now we're going to hear from, the, you know, the, the, the hard end of the, of the thing, you know, the actual process of of printing from the plate in 2021 and I think it's fascinating that you know we, we can actually get these prints off from something that is um, the age that it is. Thanks Vanessa. Um, so I've, I've got some slides here, I've got quite a few images for you just to give you a bit of background. Uh, first of all uh, I'm Alistair Clark, I'm the studio director of Edinburgh Makers um next slide please just to give you a bit of background about what printmaking is in edinburgh printmakers we are we're the first open access printmaking studio in britain and formed in 1967 as you can see uh printmakers then were considerably better dressed perhaps than they are nowadays but we try we do try our best um next slide please uh, there is a big difference between uh, contemporary printmaking and printing as such, pr printmaking being much more about creating through uh, processes and materials, some of which are 
uh, old print printing processes, but often they're adapted to be more creative. And uh, but you know, at the same time, we often encounter strange uh, and interesting historic printing plates uh, as we use historic printing processes. Um, uh, next slide, please. This this strange plate was probably the most strange and curious that I've encountered in my thirty years, though I think, and certainly the one with the most. Uh, uh, amount of mystery and intrigue about its its creation and uh, what happened between being created and being turned up in a bog uh, and being printed so and having been printed by DY Cameron first of all as well uh, fantastic to to be involved in this project uh, next slide please so Edinburgh Printmakers as we we are an, uh, art, an artist studio for artists to come and make their own prints we've we moved in 2019 Bit of, sorry, a bit of sh shameless plugging here. Uh, so we relocated and we are now in Castle Mills in Fountain Bridge in Edinburgh. Next slide, please. So we we opened just before the pandemic. You can see this, our much expanded studio space here before any presses are put in there. Next slide, please. And here with, with our equipment in there, printmaking is uh, as was touched on uh, in the introduction about the strange plate, that first of all you also also need a printing press if you're going to produce any prints. So we we have facilities for artists to come and make their own prints. Um, next next slide, please. And now we have twice as much space for our printmaking facilities than we had in our, in our Union Street facilities. Next slide, please. And this is in, in all types of printmaking processes, etching, lithography, screen printing, relief printing, all sorts of types of photo printing and uh, laser printing, digital printing. It just keeps expanding, which is why printmaking is quite a, a vibrant modern process, as well as being using uh, ancient and traditional printing processes, which we generally adopted and adapted to our own, our own means. Next slide, please. Uh, and we're very much about teaching printmaking to, to artists and, and uh, training artists so that they can express themselves with these mediums. Uh, it's not really about high production, it's about what you can create with these materials. Next slide, please. So here we have the etching part of the etching area. And you can see the etching presses that we use for printing the strange plate. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the plate itself, so when we're teaching uh, etching, the first thing we really talk about is preparing your plate. And uh, <laughs> when first seeing this plate, it was the most curious thing that I've ever seen. Uh, because in, in preparing a plate for etching, first of all, we generally try and start off with a a nice flat smooth piece of metal and uh, it, the most intriguing thing about the history of this plate is it was alleged the actual metal was produced in haste uh, on the sabbath and with reluctance uh, but the most unsuitable piece of metal really because it's as you can see from this photo it's not flat or smooth in any way and that uh, is such is such a strange and curious thing that then the amount of work that would then go into producing the image on the plate when it's been prepared so roughly um, and yeah so it, it, it was very intriguing why it, it came to be in this in this condition in the first place um, next slide please uh, and you know inspecting it as well as the tarnishing which is expected when it's, it's so old uh, it, the, because it had been printed previously already, the etched lines do start to wear, the plate starts to get slightly smoother through printing, and as, as a, a, an addition had already, already been printed, as Vanessa mentioned, we recommended that it would be, it would make the, the plate progressively smoother if we were to print a big addition from it, and it was wise to, to kind of retain the quality of the metal, not to print too many prints from it, which would result in it getting a bit smoother. So. I think that was the, the right call to go to go with there. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing that's worth mentioning about about the plate is that 
curious thing, it has three drilled holes at the top, not just one drilled hole, which I, could, I can understand if it had been perhaps hung on a wall, but having three drilled holes uh, is very curious. Um, not perhaps the wisest thing to do to a nice plate. Um, you can see that the modern use of how to correct this, this very knobbly surface, um, special cotton buds. I'm not sure what would have been used by DIY Cameron or indeed uh, Robert Strange. I don't think cotton buds were probably around then, but in terms of wiping the background tone nice and clean so that it just revealed the design, the cotton bud is the most useful uh, modern uh, tool for such a job. Next slide, please. So in, in, in inking the plate, uh, the, it's printed as an etching, which means that the etching ink is forced into the design that has been etched into the plate. It's all covered in ink. The, the ink is forced into each of those grooves and then very carefully wiped back with cloth to reveal just the ink left in the grooves and reveal a, a nice, ideally a nice smooth, polished, clean surface uh, on the top of the metal. I think you, you have had a little sense of that in the, in the film there earlier as well. Next slide, please. Once the, once the plate is fully inked, uh, it's placed on the etching press here. Next slide. And this is our one of our current presses. It looks like an, a very old press, but this is these presses are still manufactured to this design. They're seriously heavy duty, uh, cast iron and steel, uh, so that it can give an awful lot of pressure to transfer the ink from the etching plates grooves onto softened, dampened paper uh, and transfer that ink. And certainly a concern of mine was with this plate being so sig uh, historically significant was that it also wasn't, um, it was it was kind of more like a poppadom than an etching plate really. Um, and being not a flat object, I was concerned that there, it might be damaged by um, running it through the press. Um, but obviously having taken a test pl uh, printer to a quite low pressure to establish uh, that we weren't going to damage it, uh, we then increase the pressure enough to get proper a proper print from that plate. Next slide, please. So uh, these images were taken the, the very first uh, time that I encountered the plate and we took these test um, prints. The printing of the edition, we, we um, fine-tuned the pressure a little bit more so that it, it was sufficient to uh, to give good prints and to, to take the ink out of the grooves of the plate. Given that the plate is slightly more worn now, uh, it needed uh, a bit more fine tuning than your average etching plate. Next print, please. Next slide, please. Oh, I think we are, uh, uh, we are at the end of my slides. Apologies. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, an indication of what goes on with printmaking. Um, and, and the film, I think, is fantastic. Just give a little bit more of a flavour of, of making it as well. So thank you for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Alistair. It's fascinating to, to see, the, see the process and also add a little bit of a, a view into the world of, uh, world of printmaking. Um, Chris, I think you're going to be, be letting us know a little bit about the um, framing of the print, but also what sales stroke raffle um, options are, are available. Yep. I, I, I will be looking for a winning raffle ticket, please. So. Yes, well, that's, that's grand, all available. Um, thank you for the opportunity here. Now, we thought we really should make the best of this print because um, it's likely that this is the only print to be taken from this plate, certainly this century. So we've made the very best of it. And of the 22 prints which have been made by Alistair, uh, number one, we have had framed especially framed, uh, as was described in the film, uh, with wood, which came from the Beach Avenue at Nakari. 
those beeches planted by Loch Heal um, as, seep, as saplings um, at a time when he had to rush off to Glenfinnan because Prince Charles Edward had landed to raise the standard. Those trees are now coming towards the end of their natural lives. And by the kind permission of uh, Donald Cameron of Loch Heal, we obtained some wood, as was described in the film. And um, we had this wood dried and um, turned um, by Peter Davis, a local master craftsman. Um, and I'll show you in a few moments uh, 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 exactly what he's done for us. It's a fine job. And the print was was put into frame by Gillian Sloan, again, um, expert framer in Fort William, all done locally, um, but to the highest standard. Um, of the 22 prints, uh, which we have had printed, the museum will be retaining five. Um, number one, which I'll show you in a few moments, in the frame, the beach frame from the Beach Avenue in Aknakari, will be sold at Lyon and Turnbull in Edinburgh on the 18th of August uh, next month. Um, that's number one of the 22. Um, Marx is number one, and in that sense is quite unique um, in this uh, Beechwood frame. Um, the, we felt it was, it, was, it was important that everybody should have a chance to have one of these. So we will be raffling one print an unframed print and tickets will be available from through the West Island Museum, uh, priced £10 um, and unlimited number as things stand. Uh, access to exactly how to go about this is on the website, but a, a phone call to the museum or better still accessing our website will, will, um, will open up the, um, the, the, the process to you. There is a donate button there and uh, tickets tickets although they are they're not physical tickets um but um virtual tickets if you like which will be numbered uh, and we will receipt you with those and give you your number can be bought if wished in multiples of of 10. Uh, if you buy 10 tickets at 10 pounds each you have 10 better chances i suppose um the remaining 15 prints we will sell um we will announce the selling price for these tickets um, just after the first print has been sold. And um, anyone who would like to consider buying one of these, please email the museum um, rather than phone, but email would be preferable uh, with your details, with your name, um, your address, your email, uh, and your telephone number, expressing an interest and we will record your details. And in the afternoon of the day when we have chosen, when we decide what the price will be, we will inform you. Now that date is the um, 27th of August at 12 noon, we will announce the price of the 15 unframed prints. And if you, with the, uh, the price that has been chosen, um, decided upon, um, if you would like to pursue that, then please register with us sometime over the following week. Um, in the event that it is oversubscribed, more than 15 people would be prepared to buy the print at the going price, then um, on the 7th of September, Tuesday the 7th of September, uh, those, um, those potential purchases will be drawn from a hat. And at the same time, on the same day, perhaps shortly thereafter, um, an automatic number, um, uh, random number calculator will produce a number which will identify the person who's won the raffle. Um, good luck to everyone. I mean, clearly this is something we're doing to celebrate uh, 100 years or near 100 years as a West Island Museum. Uh, but we're also doing it as a fundraiser, and I'm sure you'll appreciate that. And that the, we see the uh, donations, be they a £10 donation for the raffle or um, a purchase at the sale as a donation to the museum. And I, and I really would just like to record that a lot of the people on, along the way here who have allowed this to be possible, professional folk have contributed um, in kind, as it were, uh, so as to maximise the income to the museum. 
I think that's all I have to say. Um, yes, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions, but I would refer you to the museum website where I'd like to think all is revealed. Thank you. That's great, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but I, I think we'll just move straight on to Colin, Colin Fraser, who I, I think you're going to do the auction or, or you're in charge of the auction process and you're, you're going to give us a bit of insight into that. Absolutely. Thank you. No, I, I'm in charge of the auction. I don't know if I'll be the one on the rostrum on the day, but certainly I'll be the one sort of keeping an eye on the, pulling the strings in the background. So thank you very much for inviting me along today and actually being fascinating. I thought I knew a little bit about the notes and the plate, and it turns out I knew less than a little bit. So it's been a great education as well. But Lyon and Turnbull, delighted to be involved. We've had a long-standing relationship with the West Highland Museum and really love to support as and when we can. And what better time to support than at the centenary and in such a fantastic way. I think this is a really unique project for museums to take on board. This is a big, a big jump to do something as, as interesting and different and, and do it so well. Um, reproducing things in collections isn't simple, but capitalizing on that interest, that excitement, and we hope on the value. Um, the DIY Cameron prints, when they do occasionally turn up for auction or in retail, you know, regularly, well, irregularly they turn up, but when they do, they regularly sell for over over a thousand pounds. These are rare things. These are um, a real part of history, not just of West Highland Museum or the Jacobites, but everything that goes around that. So we'll be very pleased to offer it on the 18th of August. It'll be part of our annual Scottish Silver and Applied Art Sale, which always includes interesting Jacobite pieces as well, and really has over the years become a focal point for people interested in collecting, the museums, institutions, or private collectors of this type of material. And we're expecting, we're hoping and expecting a lot of interest at home and abroad. And I was already asked today twice by people, what do I think this is going to make? And the answer is I hope as much, well, I know as much as possible, and I hope that's a big figure. Um, this is a really unique opportunity. Banknote, print number one, I shouldn't say banknote, but print number one, the last time this will be printed for our generation, if not longer, I think is, is remarkable. And that added interest, that added value of the frame, the whole story, and really seeing this group of craftspeople people and specialists coming together to make this as, as special as it possibly can be has been fantastic. So if there are any questions about the auction, any questions about that process or how to become involved, then do there's questions and answers at the end here. But if there's any, do just pop them in the Q&A just now or direct a message to me. I can also be found through Lion and Turnbull's website, which is lionandturnbull.com. And there's a picture of me looking, I was sitting with an email link below, so you can find me without any problem. And do get involved. Um, the raffle's great. We can't guarantee you win, but if you keep your hand up long enough, we guarantee you will win the auction. So, um, without much further ado, I'll hand back because my part comes on the 18th of August, not today. So, but again, thank you for everyone for attending and your interest, and do keep in touch. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, there's a question about can can prints be reserved for proven descendants of Sir Robert Strange? Well, I, 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 I think you might need to have a committee meeting on that. <laughs> Definitely partake in the auction. We're very happy that Jacobite descendants take part of any auction that we have, or Hanoverian descendants, but certainly with 15 to go around, I'm, I'm not going to make the committee decision, but I would say come to the auction. Yes, uh, so I mean, everything's all resting on the auction in the first, in the first instance, isn't it? Because that, that's the number one plate, and so that's your first shot of, of getting, getting it. And then... To, to put a value out there or to put an estimate out there for what numbers two to 15 sell for, it, it's a mistake. We can't guarantee who'll get these things, how many changes will be. So by creating this as a unique one-off with an extra special angle to it, it gives a real, a real accessibility. If we were to put a price out there of £5.99 for a stupid number, it would not encourage anyone to be £6.99. So um, I think what people need to bear in mind is these are Unique is the wrong word when there are 15 for sale, but these are a virtually unique, remarkably high quality produced um, piece. It's not a reproduction, it's from the original. This is not something that will be replicated. 
Therefore, the rarity, the story, the value is created with all these things, let alone the romance of the whole thing and that provenance as well. So um, Chris and Vanessa and Ian and myself, I think we'll keep, well, I don't know the answer, so I can easily keep quiet, but until after the auction, I think it's all focused towards raffle and auction, but that does give everybody an opportunity to take part in the first place. So. Um, but but I'm, I'm sure that the, the uh, I, I, I don't know, I can't speak for West Ham Museum, but I'm sure that you would be really delighted to hear um, from any people who are descendants of Sir Robert, Sir Robert Strange, and hear the stories of the relationship between the. Uh, and I, I, I would be interested to hear any such, such stories as well. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, Ian Fitzgerald, I believe, is directly related. Um, and we've also um, had the clan chief, I think it is, um, in Cornwall. He's been in touch as well and asked about acquiring one for the Clan Strange archive. Okay, so 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 all, all these issues are under consideration and will be catered for in a sympathetic, sim sympathetic manner. Um, and uh, as as part of this, and as part of the sort of collaboration between um, University St Andrews and West Highland Museum, we we've, we've been very lucky to get some funding from the um, uh, Scottish Funding Council um, to do some to do collaborative work, and as Part of that, the next stage of that, I think um, Catherine Cassidy, who's a PhD student at St Andrews, is going to be doing some internship work on the um, uh, West Highland Museum 100, um, 100 objects. And the, here, the thing here is, is that it's the 100th anniversary of the, uh, of the museum, and we're wanting to get 100 objects, you know, on, online in interactive galleries. And a lot of progress has been made. We've got a great gallery with 100 objects in it and I think Catherine is going to be trying to take this on to the next stage or the next phase with uh, with Vanessa. Yep um, so just as like a bit of an update on that and to tie this in a little bit with um, the strange plate because it is one of our objects that is on the gallery now um, that the the 100 objects so far, because this project really started once lockdown hit, um, have been kind of lim not necessarily limited, but using the museum's already produced digitized collections um, and adding them. So we've been even continuing from that and having them up, um, been adding and updating new images, kind of streamlining a bit of the back end process to be able to pull metadata that's been added. Um, Vanessa has done so much work on this um, that is from the, the museum's collections into this uh, archive virtual museum just for better access to be able to view them in thematic galleries and kind of reflective of how they're presented as well in the physical museum. Um, so but what, what we're going to continue, which was kind of a bit of the, um, the guiding light for the first one we wanted to do, but then now that we have a little bit more of a leeway um, for access to the physical objects, uh, is that we'll continue doing this by digitizing um, some of the, some of the select objects in 3D. Um, and plate might be one of them. I need to have a, a better look at it, but that would be quite cool. Um, now that I've seen quite a lot of it during this talk, I'd like to get my grubby hands on it. No, I won't. Um, but by doing by doing 3D. Um, and so a little bit um, kind of as an example of one 3D, 3D object that's already on the gallery and not produced by us, but uh, fantastic quality, uh, great model, is that you prioritize the fidelity and the accuracy to the original object because you are not only digitizing, you know, it's it has the same kind of positive um, qualities of traditional digitizing in, in flat is that you then have greater accessibility, um, better for remote research. Um, but with 3D, you have the full three-dimensional um, investigatory and, and, um, and an interrogation of the object, and especially if an object's fragile or if it's heavy or if it's out and not, or not out, but away in a collection, not being able to see it um, in maybe in the museum store. So even though you may have it presented, people can see the physical one in the museum, they won't be able to really interact with it um, to the degree that you can with 3D and as well, you can do it from home. 
Um, so then once you create this 3D digital asset, then the, um, the abilities of, of what and the potentials of what it can do is pretty much then boundless. Um, but one of the things that you taking it a step further, if you wanted to, is, is implementing it and putting it back into a reconstructed virtual environment. Um, so let's say the original context of an object and where it came from or, or where it was found or what its purpose was uh, then can be virtually reconstructed. That 3D model that is based completely on the original object can then be placed back um, into, into its original context, which might prove its significance and value, or I think funnily enough, just insignificant sometimes. Um, yeah, so by developing and creating um, a larger 3D digital mass of these objects, then all of a sudden you have so much potential within your digital collections itself. Um, and then we've used this um, IIIF player, uh, which is open source to be able to investigate flat images as well as 3D. Um, we've expanded it to do 360 virtual tours. So then you can place that reconstruction into a virtual tour in a very simple, um, straightforward way of viewing it. Um, so yeah, and it then uh, can be invaluable, obviously, if we've seen remote, so people at home. So we've seen the whole museum at home um, movement be incredibly powerful and not restrict audience access um, and obviously not dissuade audience interest. Um, so I think what you'll see with museums opening back up and people starting to travel, but you're going to see probably a, a greater interest that was built over lockdown and built through digital collections uh, wanting to actually come see the originals and come see what they have learned and what they've seen um, online. So, but then you could use it in the museum as well. And what we've seen before uh, COVID, it was obviously lots of hands-on and immersive and virtual AR, VR um, interactives, but then also you can do things now that's a bit more COVID friendly, like streaming to per people's personal smartphone devices and um, using their computers and their, their pockets essentially. Um, and having kind of a layered uh, available interpretation to them. So you can add more just beyond what's already presented in the museum. Um, if you want to highlight such as like this personal, this very um, detailed story of the, of the uh, strained plate, you can have that through kind of a smaller um, exhibition, maybe streamed via a local museum and with the 3D object with it. So it's just, you, you keep going. So we have, uh, yeah, we have a few things kind of in the pipeline, um, including some virtual reconstructions as well. So it'll be uh, interesting, interesting to see what happens come, you know, next few months. And yes, I hope uh, be doing quite a lot of digitization up in Fort William. Thank you very much. Sorry, Vanessa, I didn't mean to. Oh, sorry, yeah. I was going to say, we're very much looking forward to the, the extra work that you're going to be putting into the gallery. It's really exciting. Yeah, I, 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 we're looking forward to it very much um, as well. And so we come back to um, Ian Peter McDonald, chairperson of the, who's going to, uh, West Highland Museum, who's going to, give us some conclusions um, and uh, tell us a little bit about the future of West Highland Museum um, and, the cap and the capital project. So really interested to hear, hear that. And thank you very much everybody for contributing. Um, it's been a, been a pleasure to uh, introduce, every, introduce everybody and to listen to what you've got to say, but I'm sure Ian will have some more to say on that. Right. Well. <laughs> First of all, it was very striking. Oh, my face has got a bit big. I'll just move back a bit. <laughs> um, it, it was very striking seeing that last presentation of what St Andrews are doing. Uh, what what a what a way of um, taking our what a way of taking artifacts in our collection, and somebody in California or New Zealand being able to access what we're doing in such detail. And I I would dearly hope that that 
um, that will encourage enthusiasm for our collection so that people actually come to Fort William specifically to, to look at what we have in the collection. So I'm very excited about that, as well as encouraging scholarship and, and enabling scholarship even, even from a distance. So I think that's a really exciting initiative. And I'm, you know, we're very grateful for the team at St Andrews for their, for their work on that. The other point I want to quickly say is, I think what we are offering, there was some discussion about the word unique. Uh, th this is a, a, such an exceptional circumstance, producing 22 plates, 22 prints from that plate. That very first one will have this frame made from the beech wood from Achna Carry. That is a that is unique. And I think uh, with it, am I right in saying, Vanessa, there'll be a, um, a, a document explaining a bit of the history around that piece? Um, yes, we're drafting um, a booklet at the moment um, that will be accompanying the sale of all right. the um, prints and then perhaps being sold um, in our bookshop later too. Oh, sorry, I think Pete's has disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had some beer to sell very quickly. <laughs> so um, I the brewery. <laughs> yeah. Well, the door was open. The blood walked in demanding beer. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all that expertise, all those individuals who put that work into informing us. It was great to have the depth of their knowledge. And as, as Colin was saying, you know, we thought we knew something. We knew absolutely nothing relative to what we now understand. I'm just going to shut this door. Uh, Jonathan, uh, we have a... Is Jonathan still here? Yes, I am. Uh, Jonathan, we have a... Uh, there's a curious story that comes out of uh, this place called the High Bridge, where the first shots of the Jacobite uprising took place which is next door to Chris and I down the road and that is that as one of the officers was running away it is understood that he had a banknote in his possession and he cut the number out and stuck it down his boot and then threw the rest of the paper away and the story is that he subsequently presented it to the bank and demanded the money back is this a story you've ever heard? Um, actually, I haven't heard that story, but um, I can believe that because notes were uh, cut up and sometimes people would present part of a note to the bank and say, can I have my money back? Um, and depending on the circumstances, the bank would, might pay up. They would probably take an indemnity uh, so that if the rest of the note or any other section of it showed up, then they would have recourse to the, the individual they paid out on. But yes, if he just cut the number out, I would have thought they would, they might have thought twice about it because that's not a very big portion of the note, but they would be able to check whether that a banknote with that number had been presented. Um, and if it hadn't, then yeah, they would have honored that in all likelihood. Yeah. But I hadn't heard that particular story. Thank you very much. I've only seen it in one source. No, there is actually evidence, um, Pete. The Museum on the Mound have a, in Edinburgh have a copy of a letter from the soldiers pursuing the bank to get their money back. I don't know if they were successful or not, though. Ah, <laughs> great. That is great. And uh, so, the Jonathan, bank, thank you so much. And, and that's okay. Good. I was going to say the bank would have been uh, fairly uh, keen to know who they were dealing with. So they, you know, just somebody walking in off the street that was otherwise unknown to the bank, they, they might have taken a little bit of time to make their minds up, but they should have, they should, against an indemnity, um, have been ready to pay out. And they, they certainly did that in the past. These were officers in the Royal Scots. I understand that they're the very paragon of respectability in the mid 18th century. Well, then in that case, it goes without saying. <laughs> Which brings me to Colin's point about Hanoverians. I think the descendants of Hanoverians, we will charge a premium for actually, if that. 
<laughs> if that opportunity arises. Um, I want to just give you a little bit of context as to what we're aiming to do next year. First of all, Vanessa is pulling together an exhibition of Jacobite portraits, which we'll be showing in the course of, of the year. I think that's going to be at the end of the year, is it not, Vanessa? Is it October, November? Um, we're still looking for funding at the moment, but it, it should be scheduled for the beginning of August for three months. So, so that will be a really exceptional collection, uh, never before assembled in the, to this degree in one place. And we'll be very proud to show it up in the West Highlands at the museum. Uh, in the course of next year, we'll also be developing our, our funds for our capital project. We're working with a, a celebrated architect called Helen Lucas. I don't know if you've worked with Helen before any of you. She did the Dovecote Gallery in Edinburgh and she also worked well, her husband, Mark and Fraser, did the Dovecot and did the Lion and Turnbull building. Um, Helen's got a more contemporary slant, but is a huge respecter of the historical context. And more importantly, from our point of view, also lives at Rochman, which is in our parish. So we're delighted to be working with an architect of that calibre. The objective is we do have a, a building on the high street in Fort William. At the moment, the museum is set back from the high street and is in Cameron Square at the top right hand side. Um, this building on the high street will give us access to the high street. This will likely have an effect on our visitor numbers and make it easier to visit the museum. It will also give us a shop front. It's an old, lovely old late 19th century shop front that we have. And we're, this will allow us to have a shop front to allow us to put in a retail presence of some hopefully some excellence. Uh, that, that will help sustain the business of keeping a small museum going. It's important to us to get a good retail income. And we, we just need the engine to be slightly bigger than it currently is. And that will allow us to do that. This new building will also allow us to have a first floor where we can, where the, we can offer better educational facilities it gives us much more space for the team to work in and it frees up the existing the existing office so that that can or could be a study space. We're very keen to get national recognition for the quality of our collection and particularly the Jacobite collection and we need to have a dedicated space for academic study and that will allow us to have that. For, uh, as well as this and possibly even more importantly at the moment, we're an old bank, as Chris described, and we need to have much better access so that people can come in uh, who, who, who struggle with disability and wheelchairs and the like, we can give them much better access throughout the museum. So these initiatives that we will be endeavouring to introduce next year will make a, di a big difference to us. It will also give us access from the high street directly, uh, which will will make it will make a difference to the experience of the museum. That is the objective. This particular initiative is going to make a really dynamic start to that process. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the it's the 18th of August, isn't it, Colin? Um, and have you any idea what lot will be in the in the catalogue? We haven't decided as yet. We're, uh, if there's a lucky number, we could maybe put it that uh, there for well, either 22 or 1745. I think would be. Oh, whether 45 is a lucky number? No, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's it's not the number. It's not the lot number that matters. It's the number of that's the, that's the one I'm keen on. So yes, okay. Well, 22 is obviously uh, our lucky number at the moment. So just to summarise, I'd like to thank you all very very much for all your um, thought and contributions. Thank you for watching what we're doing. I understand this is now being videoed and can be accessed in the future. And please do come and see us at the museum. We like showing people what we do digitally, but we really enjoy you coming into our space and exploring all those other things you chance on in our distinct cabinet of curiosities at the West Island Museum. So thank you very much again. Um, questions if if um, you'd like to either put them into the chat or or um, 
you know, switch your microphone on and fire away. Vanessa, um, has anybody thought about um, opening a book on the um, final price, on the price that you get? It might be a, an extra revenue stream for you. <laughs> no, we haven't. I'm yeah. sure there might be rules of against gambling. <laughs> you're, not, you're not allowed to do that? Okay. I don't know. Um, Given the Jacobite campaign is a gamble, it doesn't seem unreasonable to start gambling. <laughs> um, there's been in in the chat. There's been um, on of, on Facebook and here. There's been lots of really really positive um, comments and, and appreciation um, from all over the world, and including Gothenburg, Sweden, um, and and Rebecca's been very kind to me about just how fantastic she thinks the. Uh, project is and I, I i think it's great the way you, you focus on this important thing and and then the, there's such a range of different topics from from you know printmaking to banknotes to the history of the jacobite cause oh there we go we've got los angeles as well so that's um california um I, i'm sure the weather in los angeles is normally is, is almost as good as the sunny day we're having in five uh, Shaker Heights, Ohio. So we, we have a, a true international um, international gathering of people. Um, I, 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 um, it, I would open it up also if any of the, the speakers that have uh, you know a, a final comment they'd like to to, to leave us with, and that would, I think would be welcome. A comment. I would just say I've had a couple of messages in the chat bar directly to me, people not wanting to put in the full. If anyone wants to drop their email address or contact details in the chat bar directly, I'll keep a note. We'll make sure to send email links out to the item, link to the live auction as well. Um, and hopefully you'll see lots about it in the press. We're hoping to get really good press coverage for, as we've all discussed, is such a great story. So do, do find me um, through lineandturnbull.com. Do message me just now. And we'll very happily keep everybody in the loop and see what we get to. And although it's 45 degrees in Palm Springs, it feels like that in Space Side today as well. So there we go. <laughs> that's uh, that that that's great. Yes, uh, it was Palm Palm Springs. Interesting to to hear that you're you're tuning in from Palm Springs. That's um that's great to hear. But then, so are you, are you, do you have any kind of like closing comments or or, or anything you right you want to kind of sort of emphasize? Well, again, Chris has already covered it. Um, and as far as the print sales concerned, you can register an interest at the museum by emailing us at the info at westhighlandmuseum.co.uk. Um, and uh, again, just to reiterate that if you'd like to purchase raffle tickets, the easiest way to do that is to hit the donate button on the uh, museum's website. So you go to the museum work website. Um, mm -hmm. Should we pop that in the um, in the chat? What is the URL for that? Because we put the WHM one hundred one in, but um, yeah, it's just West High West Highland Museum, is it? So, yeah, I'll pop it in the chat now. Pop it in the chat, and people can just uh, click through. It would be good if we made some sales during the uh, during the event. That would um, well, put a smile on everybody's faces. So you know we we can do the red nose day thing, can't we? We should have a we should have had a um, what do you call it? One of those um, barometer type things and had, had a target for the for the event. Um, uh, yeah, um, Doctor Ware is, is is thanking you for limiting the number of prints. I, I think it's um, refreshing to see that sort of re responsible management of of a. a rather an important heritage resource it would be sad to think that it had been um yeah it would have been completely right. unethical for us to have gone forward had there been any risk to the plate at all but as um alistair mentioned it will become smoother over time the, the more prints are taken from it um so yeah we, well, what is we the value of the print um the actual, I think it's like a penny. I don't know what a penny would have been worth back in 1746. <laughs> a lot more than it's worth now, I think. Yeah, so I think and, it's... Another like eight. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it one piece of paper that it generates or is it multiple pieces of paper? Um, it's 
in the gallery you've got the, the there's the one plate and you'd have to print from that so um alistair can probably correct me on this if i'm wrong but i believe that for every print he had to re-ink um yeah is that right alistair yeah absolutely it's it's uh it's it's a slow way to produce uh, something that would be so it would, you would think it would have significant value then uh, I mean, etching is still part of, of the uh, how banknotes are. It's one of the processes you used in banknotes still, but they are inked by machine, of course, not surprisingly. Um, but yes, it's, it's a considerably slower process to print by hand. But if you're making very these... Very also, I will start to add in. Well, I thought it was very curious that this, the notes were so small. You know, they they're, must be that size by the time they were cut up. Very curious. You lose them so easily in your sparring, surely, if you carry one <laughs> over it. I did <laughs> wonder if it was mainly maybe due to the, the copper that was available to him in Inverness that he was working with restricted materials, so perhaps that's why they were a lot smaller than you'd normally expect. Yeah. So there's a question here, is it, is it was it one penny sterling or Scott? I guess it was yeah. in sterling. Jonathan would be able to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, they, 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 this would have been sterling, and I think from looking at the plate, they were one. They were they got it prepared for one penny, two tuppence, three pence, and four pence, and then the others were left open where you could actually fill in the amount. I think the idea is if they'd printed it off, they would have cut them up into the individual sections uh, and used them to pay the troops. Um, but yes, as an individual piece of paper it would have been very small much smaller than the contemporary banknote the ones that I was showing which would have been uh you know four or five inches by four or five inches and they're much larger than those very very small ones but um you know I think that was driven by circumstances uh, obviously the plate had you know had, had only got a limited amount of material to make the plate in the first place um I mean what's interesting for me is also is that there is absolutely no text other than the amount there's no text there. There's no nothing there that's saying anybody's promising to pay anybody else. Uh, and as I read it somewhere, um, the idea was that these would have been distributed to the troops on the understanding that they would have been redeemed after Bunny Prince Charlie had uh, regained regained the throne. So um, you know, none of that's on obviously printed on the uh, the notes, but. Um, you know, the, the, there's no guarantee that um, they would ever have been redeemed anyway. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I, I think it, it makes them um, really quite a beautiful object, though. The fact that it's and, it, and the fact that it kind of sets it sets it apart from um, the existing notes. I think is it, it, it's very um, interesting, and, and the, the sort of interrelation between um technology and uh art artistic kind of kind of representation and the politics um that that interplay i think i think, I think is fascinating and it very much adds to the uniqueness of the uh, artifact that you have at the museum can you tell us how many people signed up for the presentation for for, for this presentation um so 110 people signed up for it. I just wanted to say that it's been an absolutely fascinating uh, project to be involved in, and uh, and just really to wish you all good luck with with how it goes and and your sales and your uh, then your new building when the extension to your building when that comes, which I'm sure it will. Yeah, no, thank you to you, Alistair. We couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> but yeah, it's been truly fascinating. Yeah. Alistair can get one of the VIP badges. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Well, I'd like to say thank you. I'm going to have to run now, but um, thank you all for putting this together. It's been exceptional and thoroughly enjoyable. Thank you. Um, great. I, I think that that's, I, if, unless anybody is no, thank you to, um, to make a final you. comment, I, I think that that's appropriate to give Ian the last word and we can um, close the close the event. If not, stick your hand up quickly. No? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um,
<laughs> Good, goodbye and um, predating Culloden Scottish, one penny coin were made in silver and known as sterlings, and the last Scottish coins were Queen Anne's. That's great. And um, there's a URL um, in the chat, and if you click on that URL, you'll be able to go to the video. Um, so, um, but the URL will disappear very soon. So, if you do want to share this with with friends or, or people, then just take a copy of that URL there um, and paste it into an email or, or however you communicate, um, and that should take you to a to to the video of this event. Um, okay. On that note, thank thank you very much to all the speakers. Thank you very much to everybody who, who came along. Um, and um, we'll maybe update you on on how the uh, how, on how the raffle is uh, on how the raffle is going. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.